We're going to get started on time. Uh, I just want to let folks know that uh, our committee has a pretty major bill on the House floor this morning, a uh, bill that passed out of committee 49 to 4 on nuclear waste. And I know that debate there has started. A number of us have been there already to speak, and uh, um, our, our, our colleague John Shimkus is uh, helping to manage that bill, so I, I'm not sure that he'll be back. Uh, but we're expecting votes about 10.45, so I'm going to try to be quick with the, with the gavel, and we'll continue after that, but it'll be a series of votes. So good morning. Today we're continuing our Powering America series by taking a closer look at a very important but often underappreciated component of our power sector, the electric transmission system. Ever since visionaries such as Edison, Tesla, and Westinghouse argued the merits of using direct current versus alternative current, the manner and means by which electricity is delivered has been a complicated and, yes, controversial topic. We depend on our high-voltage network of wires and cables to transmit electricity long distances to power everything from our iPhones to our economy. A stable and uninterrupted supply of electricity is critical to ensure that the public's health and safety as well as the quality of life that we have come to expect. However, in many parts of our country, our transmissions infrastructure, like our nation's roads and bridges, particularly if you're in Michigan, is aging, congested, and in need of repair or replacement. Joining us today is a distinguished panel of experts to help us better understand the challenges that the electric transmission sector is facing, as well as the opportunities that may be within reach. While, men, while much of this debate in the industry is currently focused on generator resilience and fuel security, we cannot ignore the vital role that the nation's electric transmission infrastructure plays in the use consumer. And as such, I would argue that a resilient and reliable transmission grid is no less important. Transmission infrastructure, however, does not come cheap, and the planning and construction of new lines often takes years due to permitting and environmental reviews. Over the past couple of years, public utilities and independent transmission developers have committed over $20 billion annually to upgrade or replace our existing transmission infrastructure. And while that's good news, creating jobs, et cetera, sustained investment at similar levels will be critical to ensure that Americans have a modern electricity grid that can deliver reliable power at a reasonable cost. In addition, a predictable regulatory environment and consistent policies regarding how transmission projects are approved and paid for is essential to reduce financial risk and attract new capital. After we passed the Energy Policy Act of 05, FERC was directed to encourage investment in transmission infrastructure projects that reduce the cost of delivered power by reducing congestion on the grid. FERC responded by granting financial incentives to transmission proposals that met certain criteria, and in subsequent years, FERC began to issue a series of landmark rules to oversee and regulate the details of how transmission projects are planned, paid for, and ultimately developed. Order 1000 is the agency's most recent attempt to regulate regional and inter-regional inter transmission planning while also encouraging competition between transmission developers. However, as we heard from witnesses in our earlier Powering America hearings, while some regional transmission planning processes have become more effective, Order 1000 has all but failed to develop new lines between and among RTOs in other planning regions. Moreover, FERC's rule allowing merchant developers to now compete against traditional utilities to build transmission projects has been criticized as ineffective for a number of reasons. With the help of our witnesses, we'll explore these and other challenges associated with transmission planning, cost allocation, and competition. Finally, I hope that we can discuss how alternatives to transmission lines factor into the conversation. While high voltage wires form the backbone of our smart grid technologies, demand response, energy storage, distributed generation, and microgrids can also provide benefits similar to, to traditional transmission. Since these alternatives may improve reliability while reducing environmental impacts and cost to consumers, we should explore whether any legal or regulatory barriers stand in the way to prevent energy innovation from reaching its full potential. So we look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Yield the balance of my time to my, my good friend and colleague on, this, on the subcommittee, Mr. Long from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take a uh, few seconds here to personally introduce one of the witnesses that's here today with us, a fellow that I've known since grade school and fraternity brothers in college and on through life, and that would be one Mr. John Twitty. 
Uh, John was the former CEO of City Utilities in Springfield in my home district, and he now serves as Executive Director of the Transmission Access Policy Study Group, TASP. Welcome, John, and I want to thank you for lending your expertise to this hearing. Welcome to D.C. Gentleman yields back. Recognized for an opening statement, uh, my friend and colleague, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Rush from Chicago, Illinois. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome the witnesses uh, to the hearing today. Today we will be examining the state of electric transmission infrastructure. As you know, Mr. Chairman, there have been many developments in the nation's energy portfolio since FERC issued order number 890 back in 2007 as a way to promote open access transmission services. This rule outlined a planning process for transmission providers consisting of nine planning principles, including coordination, openness, transparency, information exchange, comparability, dispute resolution, regional coordination, economic planning studies, and cost allocations. In 2011, Mr. Chairman, FERC issued order number 1000 as a way to further improve the planning process within and among geographic regions and also to determine how transmission costs were distributed to customers. Order 1000 <coughs> was also issued to provide additional op opportunity for non-incumbent transmission developers to compete uh, to build projects within the service territory of incumbent utilities. Mr. Chairman, in reviewing this policy, it appears that the results have been mixed in regards to how successful it has been in achieving its goal. We are in the midst of a rapidly changing energy landscape, reflected in part by the emergence of renewable energy sources, low-cost natural gas, state-led renewable portfolio standard goals, as well as an increase in energy efficiency initiatives and an overall reduction in energy demand. Mr. Chairman, shifting consumer behavior is driving many of these changes as customers demand cleaner forms of energy along with new tools to more responsibly use the energy they consume, both as a way to save money and as a way to save the environment. Tra traditional methods of buying <clears throat> and selling energy are being disrupted by demand response programs and emergency, emergency uh, technologies such as energy storage and distributive energy systems uh, uh, allow consumers to produce energy and sell it back to the grid. Mr. Chairman, based on the testimony that we were here today, it appears that there are some real concerns with Order 1000, and modifications may be needed to help meet its objective. If the goal was to provide a clear and collaborative inner and intra-regional planning process, with transferring and fair cost allocations in order to spur additional competition and increase investment in grid infrastructure projects, then it is less clear that if, object if that objective had been uh, achieved. While most other witnesses believe that changes should be made, there is less consensus on what those changes should look like. So I look forward to engaging the panel today, Mr. Chairman, uh, regarding the opportunities and the challenges surrounding Order 1000, as well as recommendations for improving this policy. With that, I yield back. 
Thank you. And the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Walden, is not here. So the chair now calls upon the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Perlone, for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome our excellent panel of witnesses. In particular, I'm pleased we have Ralph Izzo, the president and CEO of PSE&G here today. Uh, Ralph and I have worked together and known each other for many years, and I value his opinion and appreciate the service that, that PSE&G provides to my constituents and to our state of New Jersey. The, the network of transmission lines are truly the backbone of the power system, and these transmission lines are critical to providing reliable electricity. But just like any large conspicuous infrastructure project, transmission projects are rarely free from controversy, and in densely populated areas such as we have in the Northeast, allocating space for any new infrastructure is often a challenge. The electricity sector is undergoing tremendous change. There are new technologies and growth in distributed generation. At the same time, demand for power has remained relatively flat. And there are new challenges of extreme weather and cybersecurity threats, along with increasing demand for the grid to be more flexible and responsive. And all these things require us to evaluate the policy tools that FERC is using to manage this evolution. We'll hear a variety of opinions today about the degree to which FERC's orders are helping or hindering investments in electric transmission. It's a challenge to get this balance right, so it's no surprise that stakeholders in this arena will have diverse opinions on how to improve these policies. If we look at the map of existing transmission lines across the country, it's hard for me to believe that we need a lot of new transmission. This is, very, this is a very mature network, but since much of that network has been in place for decades, it's also a good bet that it needs to be upgraded and modernized. This is something that com companies must consider when they're pursuing a transmission project. And a project in my own district, the Monmouth County Reliability Project proposed by First Energy, is one example where there were no serious consideration given to non-transmission options that could make the area system more resilient and reliable. It was only through the diligent efforts of a group of my constituents called the Residents Against Giant Electric, or RAGE, that this expensive, unnecessary project is not moving forward. And RAGE provided expert analysis demonstrating that transmission alternatives could be accomplished or an upgrade to the grid at a far lower cost to ratepayers, and that these alternatives were never seriously considered. The administrative law judge who reviewed the case in Monmouth County agreed with that assessment. And this project in my home district illustrates that there remains a bias to building transmission rather than using new tools. It is in the financial interests of transmission companies to build, especially when there are clear rules that allow them to recoup those investments. Determining if new transmission is needed must involve all stakeholders and be evaluated without bias. If in fact new transmission lines are needed, and in some cases they will be, then the project should go forward but where new technology can provide a cheaper solution that is less disrupted to other businesses, existing infrastructure, and communities, we'd ensure, we should ensure that those options are used. So again, the rapidly changing environment we are in right now is both exciting and challenging. FERC's efforts to address transmission challenges have been admirable, but far from perfect. There have been and will continue to be missteps along the way that require adjustment and correction, perhaps even serious revision in some areas. And so I'm hoping, Mr. Chairman, that this series of hearings is providing all of us with an opportunity to better understand where the greatest challenges remain. And again, I want to thank all of our witnesses, including Ralph Izzo, for appearing today. Look forward to your testimony. I would yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from California, Mr. McNearney. Well, I thank the ranking member for yielding. Uh, and I, as a co-chair of the Grid Innovation Caucus, I'm pleased to be part of this hearing. I thank the witnesses for their testimony and look forward to working with them create what the presidents of both parties have called 21st century electric grid. Congress needs to address the requirements of an evolving grid, including advances in technology, consumer, consumer adoption of distributed generation, and increasing cyber threats to this backbone of American industry. Just yesterday, two bills sponsored by Congressman Lada and myself focused on cybersecurity passed the full committee. This hearing is an important corollary to those efforts. What investments should we be making? What regulatory regime should we be reviewing within FERC or otherwise? And what more should we be doing to modernize our grid? I look forward to working with each of you to develop a practical, common sense proposals to creating an advanced transmission system. And I yield back. 
Thank you, and there are no more opening statements by members, so now it's the fun time. Our witnesses will have five minutes to give their brief presentation. I'll work this from left, uh, let's see, from your right to your left, and make sure you hit the button. It comes on and speak into light. And we have a former commissioner of FERC, Mr. Tony Clark, who's now a senior advisor at Wilkinson, Barker, and Nower. You're up, Mr. Clark, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and ranking member Rush. Uh, my name is Tony Clark. I'm a senior advisor at the law firm of Wilkinson, Barker, and Nower, which has offices here in D.C. and in Denver, Colorado. From 2012 to 2016, I had the honor of serving on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Prior to that, I uh, served 12 years as a commissioner and for part of the time as chairman of the North Dakota Public Service Commission. It's a particular honor to recognize my former colleague, uh, Congressman Kramer, and uh, a good friend of, of many years. My testimony today centers on a white paper that I recently authored entitled Order Number 1000 at the Crossroads. It reflects my, um, it, uh, it offers my reflections on the order, the status of it, and where it might go from there. I've attached a copy of the paper as an appendix to my testimony. As way of background, Order 1000 was promulgated before I got on the commission, not long before I got on the commission. So I didn't participate in that, but I did participate in the many compliance filings that uh, came forward in the wake of the order. Uh, the main thesis of my reflection is that however well-intentioned the order is, in practice it is falling short of the lofty goals that it set. I suggest that with the passage of a better part of a decade since its adoption, now is an appropriate time for FERC and for Congress through its oversight authority to engage in a meaningful assessment of the order. The paper concludes that one of the paradoxical results of, of the rule has been that the, the major transmission projects that many of us thought might come out of, of Order 1000 actually came out of a pre-Order 1000 world, and in the time span since Order 1000 was promulgated, uh, there really haven't been a lot of tangible products uh, that have come, projects that have come through or empirical data to support the success of the order. The, the paper concludes that if, if FERC were to better tailor the rule, especially recognizing significant regional differences across the utility industry, uh, it might have more efficacy. But succinctly, we may today find ourselves in the position of having a rule that ensures significant compliance costs, but without a lot of demonstrable benefits coming out the other side. Uh, it's perhaps ironic, perhaps ironic, that many of the most impactful transmission projects that I mentioned, such as uh, in my home region, the MISO multi-value projects, arose from that pre-order 1000 world that I talked about. I suggest that a reason for this is multifold. Some of it is that regions, um, particularly those that were served by vertically integrated utilities, were already doing a fair amount of planning within their regions prior to the order. For those regions, Order 1000 replaced that collaborative bottoms-up process with a federal top-down process where there's a fair amount of bureaucracy that's involved with it, and the name of the game is making sure that you're checking compliance checklists as opposed to actually um, bringing projects to fruition. Um, creating a federal mandate on top of what was already previously happening with Many regions has added time complexity, and we've seen in some regions a lot of litigation with, result, with, uh, with respect to the transmission projects. The electricity landscape has changed dramatically in terms of the resources, technology, and state policies that drive transmission uh, decisions, both since EPAC 05 and um, eight, uh, Order 890, which preceded Order Number 1000. Um, and then finally, certain implementation decisions, such as how cost allocation is handled within regions, has altered transmission development models that were previously broadly accepted within a number of the region. In short, even amongst those who are broadly supportive of Order 1000, there seems to be a widespread sense that something is amiss with it in terms of the underwhelming results that have come out of it. In light of this, I would argue that it's appropriate for policymakers to consider Order 1000's future given its track record. My paper encourages industry conversations about ways that Order 1000 could be streamlined across the board. While regional planning conversations may result in some benefits, and I would add there may be some benefit, especially when talking about inter-regional projects where maybe not as much uh, conversation had happened in the past, there may be ways to do it with, uh, while repealing some of the more prescriptive aspects of the order. Uh, briefly, moving beyond Order 1000, I would offer that I think there are a number of regulatory policy calls coming up 
that could have a significant impact on how transmission infrastructure will be developed. FERC has significant decisions ahead of it, um, dealing uh, with issues like uh, rates of return on transmission projects for jurisdictional rates, uh, issues related to transmission incentives that FERC builds into its rate structure, and finally, um, one of the big elephants in the room on transmission development is, as it is with pipeline development, it's, it's very difficult to get infrastructure projects cited and brought um, through the construction phase because of multiple levels of uh, sometimes bureaucracy and red tape that can block um, some of those uh, permitting decisions. With that, I conclude my testimony. Thank you. I look forward to any questions you might have. Right on time. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Our next witness is Dr. Edward Kraples. Perfect. And he is Thank the CEO you. of the Anberg Development Partners. Five minutes, Dr. Kraples. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the Energy Subcommittee. Um, my name is Ed Kraples, and I'm the founder and CEO of Amberic, which is a independent transmission microgrid storage and smart energy campus developer. We are funded by institutional investors, so we are not your typical utility. We like to think we build the electric businesses of the future, and the future is very different from the past, as other members have already indicated. We help to spearhead two high-voltage direct current buried transmission lines between New Jersey and New York. Uh, the high-voltage direct current technology is common worldwide, but not widely used yet in the United States. Uh, as a person who's actually developed interregional transmission projects, I've taken the opportunity to write an article that is part of my uh, prepared testimony that's just published in the Electricity Journal called Triple Jeopardy, and it reviews why even though everyone agrees these kinds of interregional transmission links are useful and that more are needed, both existing and new interregional projects are being choked off by well-intentioned but unproductive regulations. Some of these stem from Order 1000 and the inability to implement Order 1000 in a way that's sufficiently prescriptive to handle the many issues that arise when interregional transmission projects are proposed. I'm here this morning, however, to discuss a really important new opportunity in our power industry. Federal energy and environmental policy can accelerate what promises to be a once-in-a-generation chance to launch a new domestic industry, and that is offshore wind. If we do it smartly and thoughtfully from the start, the key to success is to plan, design, and build shared, independent offshore transmission, ocean grids, in a thoughtful way in each of the participating coastal states. The federal government obviously has a huge role in this through uh, the BOEM and uh, FERC procedures that have to be implemented as part of this plan. Why are these planned and independent ocean grids so important? Because after years of development in Europe, technology has pushed the price of offshore wind down to super competitive levels. With that, American offshore wind is now a natural component in the administration's energy dominance strategy. It is indeed fuel from heaven, and its time has come. However, as with all large-scale energy resources, indeed with any important new industry, the business, financial, and physical platform on which it is built must be carefully designed and developed. Unfortunately, some ideas about offshore wind would jeopardize the ability to realize its full potential. Early policy proposals in Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey explicitly would give generators the exclusive ability to own the transmission lines that take offshore wind to market. These proposals have been promoted by giant, largely European wind developers that would get America's offshore undertaking off on an anti-competitive and wrong footing. It's obviously in their interest to control as much of the access to the onshore grid as possible. If we allow that to happen, we will lose the kind of competition that will further lower offshore wind prices. We will lose more fishing grounds because there are more subsea cables than necessary. We will lose control over a substantial portion of our own coast. A proliferation of cables would displace and distress marine life during construction and operations and make it hard to avoid estuaries and navigate sensible, sensitive shoreline points of entry. It will undermine an industry in a vital period of its growth. We are proposing in our ocean grids a smaller number of large collector stations that are placed at the edges of the offshore wind farms. 
gathering the electricity from multiple wind farms and bringing it to shore via the minimum number of transmission cables buried in the seabed. These cables would be buried under the ocean floor and sized for multiple wind projects, and it could be either a direct current or alternating current, depending on the distance to shore. If we do it right, we'll create an industry and tens of thousands of 21st century jobs. We'll create competition between generators, and it is that competition that will bring the price of offshore wind down to market levels. I will close by saying that in Europe today, offshore wind auctions are yielding prices of four to five cents per kilowatt hour, which is pretty close to the market price. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kraples. Our next witness is Jennifer Kern. Jennifer is the Vice President of uh, System Planning at Mid-Continent ISO, but most importantly, she's a graduate of Rice University, my alma mater. Ooh. Go Owls. Go Owls. Uh, Five minutes, ma'am. Good morning, uh, Vice Chairman Olson, Ranking Member Rush, and the uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, as noted, I am Jennifer Curran, Vice President of System Planning for the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, or MISO, as we are more commonly known. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today uh, as you examine the state of the nation's electric transmission system, and I hope the insights uh, into how MISO plans uh, transmission are useful to you as you work to shape U.S. energy policy. MISO is a 501c4 not-for-profit social welfare organization with responsibility for ensuring the reliability of the high-voltage electric transmission system uh, to deliver low-cost po power to customers. Uh, that mission is reflected in our approach to transmission planning. We seek not to minimize the cost of transmission, uh, but rather to identify transmission which maximizes value to customers in the form of um, overall lower total energy uh, costs. Uh, the system that MISO manages is geographically the largest in North America. It spans from Manitoba in Canada down through all or parts of 15 states to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, a geography that wide uh, presents a lot of diversity in resource types, uh, weather, uh, state policies, and consumer preferences as it relates to uh, electric supply. Uh, transmission is a key tool to optimize uh, that diversity for the benefits of customers. Uh, that diversity also presents challenges as we seek to uh, design transmission plans uh, and probably most importantly determine who will pay for them. Even prior to Order 1000, MISO was planning not just for reliability uh, but also for economics and public policy. Of the $30 billion uh, of transmission investment that has been enabled through the MISO planning process, approximately 20% of that is associated uh, with a long-term regional planning effort uh, to address the changing resource mix known as the multi-value projects. The multi-value project portfolio is a set of 17 projects uh, that are distributed widely across the north and central regions uh, of MISO. Uh, they provide benefits of two to three times the cost, uh, predominantly in the form of access to uh, existing and new low-cost energy resources, uh, and reliably enable the renewable portfolio standards in the Midwest. Uh, Transmission, like the multi-value projects, is a longer-term view. We are about halfway through the implementation of the multi-value projects, uh, with the final project scheduled to go into service in 2023. Uh, in the meantime, as has been noted, we continue to see a great deal of change uh, in the uh, electric industry. So where do we go from here? Uh, I think the challenge in front of us is probably best described by the two questions I get most frequently about transmission planning. Uh, MISO, why have you not developed uh, the next set of regional and, and even interregional transmission? And MISO, why are you thinking about additional transmission that we clearly won't need? Uh, so that dichotomy is, is clearly representative of the diversity uh, that I mentioned, and, and that diversity becomes even broader uh, as we expand beyond the regional boundaries and plan uh, with our neighbors. Uh, but it's also reflective of the uncertainty uh, of the future as it relates to electricity. Uh, the MISO planning process 
uses a scenario-based approach. We try to uh, bound uh, the potential outcomes of the future and then look for transmission projects uh, that will be valuable in all of those futures. Uh, if we can find transmission that is valuable uh, across that wide range of objectives, then we can feel comfortable uh, that the benefits uh, will continue to accrue to customers and that we can continue to recommend that transmission. Uh, we often refer to these as no regrets uh, projects. We have a lot of planning uh, to do uh, to determine whether there is a future set of transmission that has benefits in excess of costs. Uh, and probably most critically to come to consensus on who will pay uh, for that transmission, who sees uh, the benefits and uh, believes that the cost they will bear will be in line with those benefits. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I believe that uh, regional and interregional transmission uh, will be a critical part of the overall uh, solution set as we seek to ensure uh, the reliability, the efficiency, and the resilience of the electric grid into the future. Thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Kern. We'll talk about Beer Bike and Baker 13 offline. Our next witness is Dr. Ralph Izzo. He's the CEO of Public Services Enterprise Group. Dr. Izzo, you have five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee, as well as full committee Ranking Member Pallone, who's had a long and exemplary career serving the people of my home state, New Jersey. I'm pleased to provide my point of view on the importance of continuing to strengthen and modernize electric infrastructure. Today, I will highlight one federal policy that stands as an impediment to that goal and should be repealed, that being FERC Order 1000. I'm here representing Public Service Enterprise Group and our subsidiary, PSE&G, a 114-year-old company that is New Jersey's largest electric and gas utility. PSE&G owns around 1,600 circuit miles of transmission operated by PJM Interconnection. Despite the fact that PSE&G has been named the Mid-Atlantic's most reliable electric utility for 16 years in a row, much of our electric infrastructure is old. While it has helped power the industrial Northeast for nearly a century, in recent years we have had to work to replace, upgrade, modernize, and sometimes move parts of the grid in order to ensure our system can, extend extreme, can withstand extreme weather events and other threats. For even as our customers are using less electricity, their reliance on it has never been greater. Of course, we don't have a blank check. Our investments must be prudent. Over the past 10 years, we've made improvements that have reduced unplanned transmission outages by over 80%. So the customer benefit is clear. Transmission investment has been helped by federal policies that have recognized the importance of transmission and the risk in building large projects. However, Order 1000 stands out as a policy that undermines these efforts. Enacted by FERC in 2011, Order 1000 was touted as landmark reform that would promote efficient and cost-efficient transmission planning and remove barriers to development. But in the seven years that we've been living under Order 1000, the promised efficiency looks more like confusion, controversy, and chaos. Regional grid operators have begun to voice their views. PJM CEO Andy Ott last year called Order 1000, and I quote, a solution in search of a problem that is creating more of a challenge. Southwest Power Pool CEO Nick Brown said it created, quote, more overhead and more uncertainty. Our main experience with Order 1000 has been through a competitive solicitation launched by PJM in 2013 for a project to solve voltage issues in southern New Jersey. To call the process a mess would be generous. PJM made an initial decision and then reversed itself. Disputes cropped up between states and stakeholders that the RTO had to mediate. PGM found itself having to make judgments outside its expertise, for example, on which alternatives might secure environmental permits, or how to interpret the fine print and exclusions when a developer says it will cap construction costs. Five years into the planning process, we still do not have a constructed project to address a major need on this part of the grid. And across the country, other red flags continue to appear. No region outside organized markets have even attempted to administer an Order 1000 bid. The Southwest Power Pool spent $5 million on a competitive process for an $8 million project that was deemed unneeded and never built. The California ISO awarded a project to a partnership between a foreign developer and another entity 
only to see the developer go bankrupt. Mr. Chairman, after seven years, these can no longer be called growing pains. But even beyond the chaotic implementation of Order 1000, there lurks a more fundamental concern. Order 1000 tends to drive short-term Band-Aid fixes for the grid. Projects that solve multiple problems and provide long-term value tend not to move forward because they are ruled out as being too costly. Competition is a positive force, but the goals must be set to achieve the outcomes we want. People and businesses depend on an efficient electric system that is resilient for the long term against an array of very real threats. Leaving Order 1000 in place risks our ability to achieve that end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Izzo. Chair now calls upon John Twitty, as was mentioned by my colleague from Missouri. He's executive director of the Transmission Access Policy Study Group and a dear friend of Mr. Long. So offline, you probably have some stories about him that we'd all like to hear. <clears throat> have five Mr. minutes. Mr. Chairman, sir. indeed I do. But <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am John Twitty, executive executive director of TAPS, the Transmission Access Policy Study Group. Our association has been active here in the Capitol and at FERC protecting the interests of transmission dependent utilities. We represent municipal utilities, joint action agencies, a rural electric cooperative, and an investor-owned utility, serving about 1,200 utilities with retail customers in 35 states. As load-serving entities dependent upon the transmission facilities of others, TAPS members recognize the importance of a robust grid and have long advocated policies to get needed transmission built, but are keenly aware that expansion must be achieved at reasonable cost. By enacting Section 217B4 of the Federal Power Act in 2005, Congress gave FERC clear instructions on transmission planning and expansion. FERC is directed to, is directed to facil facilitate planning to meet the reasonable needs of load-serving entities and enable load-serving entities to secure long-term firm, physical, or equivalent financial rights for long-term power supply arrangements made or planned to meet their service obligations. These directives translate into steps FERC can and should take regarding transmission planning and investment. But that is not happening, happening to the degree necessary to meet Congress' mandate. First, the grid has to meet the needs of load-serving entities. Although FERC has established rules for an open and transparent transmission planning process, even FERC has recognized that this is not happening consistently. We are particularly concerned that transmission-dependent load-serving entities do not have a seat at the table the way they would if they shared ownership in the grid. Joint transmission ownership arrangements where all load-serving entities share ownership of the grid, which have occurred in many states, have a long history of ensuring that the transmission needs of all load-serving entities are met, consist consistent with Section 217. They also facilitate the state siting process and spread investment risk and responsibility and provide an opportunity for small load-serving entities to offset their increasing transmission rates against transmission revenues, thus reducing costs to ultimate customers. Second, we need to be sure our investment in new transmission is appropriate. Consistent with Section 217's focus on the reasonable needs of load-serving entities, TAPS members have experienced rapid increase in transmission cost. While a portion of the increase is no doubt justified, transmission has become an investment magnet. The potential for guaranteed incentive elevated returns on equity on low risk transmission assets may spur investment that is not necessary. While we support FERC's ground up consideration of grid resilience, it should not become a blanket justification for excessive investment. Third, FERC has fallen short in fulfilling Section 217's directives regarding long-term transmission rights, particularly as to the capacity associated with long-term power supply arrangements on which load-serving entities rely for resource adequacy. This exposes load-serving entities to increased cost, especially if the RTO choices of large transmission owners have left them with loads and resources in multiple RTOs. It also makes new investments riskier. Fourth, above-cost incentives are not needed to attract investment. There is no shortage of entities seeking to invest in low-risk transmission asset at FERC's base equity return that is intended to reflect the cost of attracting capital. There is no need for incentive rates of return, much less to expand their availability beyond opportunities provided under current FERC policy. Those seeking transmission incentives should not be permitted to turn away load-serving entities in the footprint, 
seeking to make their load ratio investment in the grid. Finally, the transmission planning process can also be a more effective vehicle for inclusive transmission investment. Non-incumbent transmission developers, especially those that accommodate participation by small load-serving entities, should have a fair opportunity to develop needed new transmission. Congress should encourage the Commission to reinvigorate the Order 1000 competitive transmission development process in a manner that will promote joint transmission ownership as well as to use competitive discipline to curb rising transmission cost. At TAPS, we want to be part of the solution so long as the needs of our customers are met, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Twitty. Our final witness is Mr. Rob Gramlich. That's right. Rob is the president of Grid Strategies, LLC. You have five minutes for opening statement, sir. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman Olson, uh, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, today to talk about the important issue of uh, the state of transmission. There is no infrastructure more important than transmission, which is essential to the reliable and affordable electricity service we depend on for almost every modern commercial and individual activity. Since this subcommittee was involved in passing the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the industry has succeeded in building a lot of transmission. Transmission benefits have exceeded the cost by factors of 2 to 3.5 in the major in investments in the central region uh, you've heard about in MISO and the Southwest Power Pool. Transmission investment has enabled 100 billion, over $100 billion of generation investment in rural communities. Transmission investment is needed for both a distributed future and a large utility scale generation future, either one or both. We've learned a lot about what works. Regional planning and cost allocation in particular have worked well. We should build on that success. In my written testimony, I provide nine ideas for expanding transmission and improving its performance. However, none of these ideas matter if there's no leadership at the Department of Energy or FERC. I think we are waiting for that leadership. I fear the agencies are too distracted by misguided proposals to provide life extensions to old power plants. We're all wasting our time comparing different dictionary definitions of reliability and resilience when we should be updating policies for transmission. If resilience is a code word for propping up uneconomic plants, that effort needs to sink on its own poor merits, as my former boss, FERC chairman and Texas PUC chairman Pat Wood said recently. Turning to transmission, to improve transmission, most of my recommendations are for FERC, but I have some for DOE and Congress as well. It doesn't matter if it's under the heading of Order 1000, 890, 2000, or an entirely new vision they could roll out called Order 2020. We need to update transmission policy to create the grid we know we'll need in the future. I recommend that FERC and Congress preserve and build upon the twin policies I mentioned of broad regional planning and beneficiary pays cost allocation. That's what worked in Texas, that's what worked in SPP, that's what worked in MISO. That's what Dr. Craples described should be done in the Northeast. Number one, FERC should align transmission owner incentives for advanced transmission technologies. I didn't say more incentives, not asking for a subsidy. I said align the incentives so that transmission owners have an incentive to deploy cost-effective technologies. Number two, FERC should incorporate advanced transmission technologies into transmission planning. I don't like to call it non-wires non alternatives. I think they are just other transmission options. They should all be considered, along with new lines and other assets. Number three, FERC should fix inter-regional planning and cost allocation. Clearly, no improvements have been made since Order 1000's attempt to improve that. Number four, Congress, the Department of Energy, and FERC should all improve federal backstop siting. I think it's important for the future grid that we need, and we should make sure it works and is used where appropriate. Number five, FERC should require proactive planning that captures all of the values of transmission. Too often it gets compartmentalized and not all of the benefits are included. Number six, the administration should improve federal coordination and transmission permitting on federal lands. Number seven, the Department of Energy should harness the authority and capabilities of power marketing administrations. 
They can be involved in, in transmission. They can utilize Section 1222 of Energy Policy Act of uh, 2005 and help in other ways. Number eight, the administration should couple Department of Energy's uh, planning and support for uh, planning and cor corridor designation with Department of uh, Interior's efforts to identify renewable energy zones and uh, transmission corridors. Finally, Congress should consider public financing to right-size transmission. Uh, too often, we underbuild for the resources that we know will be there when our children, their children, and their children's children um, will benefit from. Those resources are, are there. We know they'll be there. Uh, even in Texas, where we built a lot of transmission, we've essentially used up that capacity. And looking back, we would have done better to uh, build it the right size. I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gromlich. And for the panel, we're having votes called within the next 10 to 15 minutes floor votes. So we'll have to basically go into recess. But until then, we'll try to get through as much member questions as possible. We have five minutes to ask questions. <laughs> and being the chairman, I'm first. And y'all know that I'm a Texan. And y'all know that Texans love to brag about fellow Texans. We say they done something good. They say that in Haskell, Texas. Haskell's the home of our former governor, our current energy secretary, Rick Perry. He did something good with what these called competitive renewable energy zones. He used those to fix the problem we had in Texas, a big problem. We have a lot of wind power. But well, we have the most power out west, rural Texas, where it's not needed. We need it in eastern Texas, central Texas, Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio. But that Crest initiative is part of why, as Dr. Crapel said, Texas leads the nation in wind power. In fact, one day a couple years ago, almost half our energy was provided by wind. Offshore Corpus Christi, Texas, that wind whips almost 300 days a year. We're making progress on that. My question is for you, Mr. Gromick. Can you talk about how the CRES model worked and whether that's something we can do elsewhere? Sure, and you are absolutely right, Congressman. The Texas CRES model, as well as the ERCOT market structure overall, is a model for the country. I think we'd be doing a lot better in all of the FERC jurisdictional areas if we essentially had the ERCOT market model throughout the Northeast and the rest of the, the uh, RTO ISO areas, as well as its proactive transmission planning model um, that has accessed all of that wind and gas resources and other uh, uh, served gas resources and others uh, out in that uh, Western Texas and the Panhandle. Uh, so essentially, it's, it's a simple formula of identifying where the generation resources are and proactively building to those resources. The alternative that is too often used in many other places is just to wait one by one for all the little projects to connect and, and no one of them are gonna build the transmission that are needed. So you need to proactively build and right size the lines to the resource area. Thank you. And uh, doctor, would you like to add anything? Dr. Kraples, you're the wind expert about the CRES model in Texas, how that worked out, the CRES model, I'm sorry. I uh, totally agree. And in the Northeast, we're looking at a wind resource offshore that could be 10 to 20,000 megawatts, Texas size, Mr. Chairman, Texas size. And yet- That's very big. That is very big. It represents a Huge. capital investment opportunity of 30, 40 billion dollars, big even by Texas standards. And yet our transmission policy in the Northeast is the opposite of that of Texas. It is let the generators build and own the transmission, which seems almost insane to me. Uh, we should do what Texas did. We should learn from Texas and build the transmission and plan the transmission first and then let the generators compete like hell to get access to that transmission. That's what she did and it works great. This is a great hearing so far. The last question for you again, Mr. Gromlich. Uh, you recently wrote a white paper about new technologies that can optimize a transmission system at a much lower cost than building new transmission lines. Can you briefly describe how that will work and how to compare that for the cost of the consumer, what the benefits are of your white paper, your plan? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. I, I formed a coalition called the Watt uh, Coalition, uh, uh, working for advanced transmission technology, and we put out a white paper uh, where we were thinking in part about wholesale customers and thinking we, we do need uh, more transmission, but we should also make sure that uh, the existing grid is used as efficiently as possible. Uh, and many of these new technologies uh, actually weren't really commercially available when the Energy Policy Act uh, directed FERC to promote them back in 2005. And so there's an unfinished chapter uh, in the implementation of Congress's act, and that is on the operational side, the utilization of the existing wires. A whole lot was done on incentives for new transmission, but nothing was done on utilization. And so, again, we're not asking for more incentives necessarily, just alignment of incentives and inclusion into the planning process. Thank you. I ran out of time here. One question, you met, uh, Mr. Clark. I'd be curious to know if you think regulators are doing a good job of keeping up with emerging technologies in the transmission or distribution space. Great A, B, C, D, or something below that. Uh, I'd say it's incomplete, um, if that's an answer. The, part of the challenge uh, when we talk about regulators is you're looking at multiple jurisdictions of, of regulatory authority. So um, unlike the case of Texas where you have a wholesale regulator that is both the retail regulator and the wholesale regulator, um, for most of the rest of the country, it's, it's very difficult to bridge some of those divides. It's just the way the jurisdictional nature plays out. FERC has wholesale authority. Um, and interstate transmission authority, but many of those other decisions regarding resource adequacy, integrated resource planning, retail uh, decisions are made at the state level. So it's tough to give an overall grade because of the natural jurisdictional divide that sometimes creates tension that... Uh, that Thank you. My time has expired. It's not time for Mr. Rush, ranking member of the subcommittee, to ask his five minutes of questions. You're up, sir. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Graham Link, uh, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, statement. We're moving into a new energy paradigm where advanced technologies such as distributive energy, microgrids, and energy storage are in increasingly being developed uh, and uh, coming online. In your opinion, is Order 1000 as constructed? the best way to in increase the deployment of these types of low-cost clean energy resources? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. We are indeed moving toward that future of a more distributed uh, network with many small, uh, sometimes uh, retail or state jurisdictional uh, resources. Uh, I think the, the planning processes need to incorporate that. I, I do not agree with those who say that means uh, we're not going to need as much of the bulk power grid. In fact, the resources are still often variable and remote, and we need to move the power around geographically uh, as well as over time, which storage can do. So we're going to need the, the big grid, so to speak, and we're also going to need much more coordination, which uh, at the local level, which is really for uh, state uh, regulators to, uh, to handle. I think uh, reliability can, and efficiency can improve, however, if we bring those distributed resources into the wholesale markets. Uh, there are going to be a lot more resources uh, available, and if there are any shortfalls, for example, if we give them access to the wholesale markets, we'll have a lot more reliability. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Clark, in your uh, written testimony, you state the reasons that are still served by vertically integrated utilities. We're already doing a fair amount of regional planning uh, before Order 1000. Uh, and you maintain that Order 1000 actually replaced a collaborative bottoms-up approach to transmission planning with more bureaucracy uh, and a compliance checklist that may not necessarily result in additional transmission developments. Uh, briefly, what recommendations would you suggest that would, uh, that would help improve Order 1000 to better uh, achieve the goals of better process planning, 
fair cost allocation, and increased competition, including for non-incumbent trans, uh, transmission developers. Thank you for the uh, question, uh, Ranking Member Rush. W what I would do for those, especially those regions of the country where, which is still the majority of the, the states, where the states maintain vertically integrated utilities, I would argue that Order 1000 should be put on a pretty severe diet um, so that it's slimmed back in terms of trying to leverage those things that were working in the past. Um, and you had indicated, uh, referenced my testimony where I talk a little bit about this. A lot of the, um, compliance obligations with regard to things like competitive bidding and, and uh, the processes that each of these regions have to go through through that don't fit very well in regions of the country that are still vertically integrated. And the, the reason is because uh, utilities working with their state utility commissions had always done that sort of regional planning in the past and, and um, it, order or uh, uh, MISO's MVP project, suite of projects was referenced earlier as a as a good example of how that worked well. Those type of projects we're not seeing coming forward anymore because now the name of the game is, well, we have to comply with Order 1000, and so it really just becomes a compliance exercise as opposed to the more organic process that happened bottoms up. I think there are some different issues maybe in parts of the country that have restructured where you might have some natural tension between generation and, um, and transition as it relates to the marketplace. Even there, I don't think Order 1000 is working perfectly as, as indicated by some of the examples that uh, Dr. Izzo talked about. Um, but at, at the very least in those vertically integrated regions of the country, I think it could be slimmed down from a compliance standpoint, maybe focus more on some of the good aspects of regional planning and collaboration, um, and maybe especially on inter-regional projects where there may not have been as much um, uh, conversation going on before, as there was uh, uh, after Order 1000. Thank you. Mr. Long, five minutes for questions, sir. It says L-O-N-G. I think I'm ready to start now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you yielding to me. And uh, Mr. Twitty, for quarter number 1000 that was just being discussed was an effort to introduce market concepts to transmission development, but the scope of transmission completion to date has been severely limited during implementation, forcing American businesses and households to overspend for transmission projects. Why is competition in this area so important? Well, I guess, uh, Congressman, first, thank you for the question. Uh, we all believe that competition brings lower prices and better services. Uh, whether that can happen in a uh, commodity like transmission or, for that matter, uh, other aspects of the, uh, of the electric business, I think is still a question out for, uh, out for debate. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's clear that we have to pay more attention to how transmission gets built uh, how its ownership share is divvied up, uh, what the rates of return are that are provided to the people who are building it. Uh, and as I've suggested, uh, there are lots of folks out there who don't have the opportunity to participate in the ownership, uh, and in some cases even the planning for these projects. Uh, I would suggest that if you really believe in competition, you really believe in having a grid that's right-sized, uh, that everybody should be at the table whether we like Order 1000, the way it was written, or the way it's been implemented is, uh, is a good question. Uh, but uh, you clearly... Think it, you think it should be re-examined or repealed? Well, yeah, I don't think there's any... Repealed altogether. Yeah, no, no, I, I, think, I think there are some good aspects of Order 1000, uh, but I think it's not working the way it was intended. And if more people were a part of the planning process, really a part of the planning process, really a part of the ownership structure, I think we would have a better outcome than we do today. According to your testimony, TAPS members in, south, in the Southwest Power Pool have seen an average annual increase, rate increase of 17% for the last five years. That's annually. A few weeks ago, the FERC commissioner sat at the same table where you folks are sitting today, and uh, I told him that your former employer, City Utilities of Springfield, has studies that show the costs are substantially higher 
and than other customers in the SPP. What needs to be done either by Congress or by FERC to fix this trend of such high annual rate increases for my constituents in Springfield, where you live? Well, I think uh, I mentioned in my testimony uh, the rates of return that are offered by FERC today are pretty attractive. I think we probably all agree that if we had our 401ks and our IRAs invested at those guaranteed rates of return, we'd be pretty happy. So I think that needs to be addressed. As I suggested, I don't think there's any need for incentives on top of those guaranteed rates of return. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a big piece of it. Uh, and uh, the bottom line, as you, as you mentioned, real customers paying real utility bills like everybody in the room pay these increases. And I would suggest that if it wasn't for um, abnormally low natural gas prices today that are masking lots of these problems, people would be at your doorsteps wanting solutions and they'd want them pretty doggone quickly. What, uh, talking about transparency for a moment here, how would uh, greater transparency transparency in the planning process of transmission building impact the cost of those transmission services? Well, I guess I think that uh, by transparency, we're including a number of things. If we have more people at the table who are actually using the transmission grid, I think it's going to help the right size grid be built. I think it's going to impact uh, the siting process. I think uh, Commissioner Clark mentioned earlier, the siting process is probably the most critical aspect of building any of these kinds of projects. I've been somebody that's knocked on people's doors asking for rights of way, and I can tell you that if you have mayors, uh, you have elected members of boards of public utilities, for instance, that are part of that process, it's gonna be a better process. It's gonna get the right thing built. It's gonna be done as quickly as possible. And all of that translates into lower cost. You mentioned in your testimony that grid resilience should not be justification for excessive investment. In our recent hearings, the concept of grid resilience has been described as a crucial characteristic our energy system needs. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I, resilience seems to be the, uh, the word of the day in our business, and there are so many risks, uh, many of them presented through cyber threats, uh, where we need to think about how the grid gets built and how the grid gets put back after an outage. Uh, we'd probably all agree uh, pretty easily on what resilience is, particularly those people who have been uh, like Dr. Izzo, running a utility today. Uh, but we shouldn't let it be uh, the end-all, be-all to build something that you can't cost-justify. I used to say to our customers, look, we can guarantee, pro we can guarantee your availability 100% of the time, but you couldn't afford the service. And then later the engineers would say, well, we probably really can't guarantee it 100% of the time. Uh, so it needs not to be an effort to gold-plate the system in the name of it'll never go down. Okay, thank you. And it's good to see Chris here also today. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Scott. Hey, you back. Thank you. Mr. McDerney, five minutes for questions, sir. I thank the chair on this. Um, Mr. Kreppels, your ocean grid collector station's proposal for offshore wind is pretty interesting. What types, what types of proposals have you seen outside of the New York, New Jersey area, including the West Coast where we have deep water uh, out there? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I've seen uh, and studied very carefully what the European countries have done. So both Germany, the Netherlands um, are the leaders in offshore wind deployment. And in both of those countries, the idea of an ocean grid that's separately owned um, has been part of the policy uh, for some time, and it works very, very well. In California, I think it would be wise to look at the offshore in the <coughs> same way that Texas looked at the upstate. It's a, it's a region with unlimited wind energy potential. Floating storage wind turbine technology is evolving so quickly, I think it will be economic within the next few years. And thinking about this from a grid standpoint, build a grid that, that maximizes the benefits to consumers would be the right way to go. Thank you. Um, do, do, do we in Congress need to do something such as pushing the BLMs offshore federal land leasing to be structured so that neighboring wind farms can use a shared infrastructure? I think that would be extremely helpful. Uh, right now, each wind generator can build its own transmission line to shore, but once they do that, that, p that place on shore is occupied by that, that generator for the rest of time. So thinking it a little bit more holistically would be very wise. Thank you. Mr. Gramlich, um, 
You mentioned earlier that uh, FERC does not need to grant more incentives, uh, but to better align the incentives that we already have. What are your suggestions on how to go about doing that? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, there are examples from other, other countries that we're currently looking at and trying to work with a number of transmission owners on, as well as FERC staff and others. Uh, in the UK, for example, when there is congestion, uh, the transmission owner has an incentive to reduce that congestion. So thereby, the, uh, the savings are shared between customers and shareholders. So that concept, I believe, could be applied here in the US. Uh, it's not an easy task to implement these forms of performance-based regulation, but I'm optimistic that with a lot of the best minds from the transmission industry and regulators, we can figure it out. So I'm kind of interested in the, in the DC <clears throat> overlay idea. Um, what would be the next steps to get that to happen? Uh, number one, having people like you say that's an important thing to do. So thank you for that. Uh, having uh, FERC and the Department of Energy take interest. Uh, I do think there is a very interesting study that I cited in my written testimony called the SEAMS study that uh, a number of national labs are working on uh, that has uh, been partially released but not fully released, and that, that will be a great model. So when that comes out, I think uh, uh, facilitating a dialogue on, on how do we get that type of grid would be very worthwhile. Right, well, you, you mentioned that there's a lack of private market interest in the public uh, in financing high capacity <clears throat> versions of the line, such as the Texas Competitive Renewable uh, Energy Zones. Uh, public financing to the right size may be appropriate. Can you discuss more about how such would be structured so that we don't build excess capacity needlessly? Uh, thank you for that. Yes, um, there's always a risk in regulated industries of overbuilding, and you need to think about that. But in this case, we know where the resources are, right? The wind resources, the solar resources, geothermal, you name it. You name it. These are location-constrained resources that haven't moved over generations, and they're not going to move over generations. I submit we shouldn't be that worried about overbuilding to access those resource areas. Our great, 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 great grandkids are going to benefit from whatever we do to build out that network. Interesting. Um, I'm going to yield back in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As a reminder, votes are about to be called. My intention is to alternate between Republican and Democrat until we have to go vote. We'll recess for maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes, and come back at 50. What? Adjourn. Okay. Okay. Next, uh, next member to ask questions is Mr. Griffith from Virginia. Five Thank minutes. you very much, and in the interest of time, I'm going to send some questions uh, afterwards as we're allowed to do within the next 10 business days, and I will do that. Uh, but I'm going to ask one question live, Mr. Twitty, because uh, I represent uh, AEP country in southwest Virginia, and you mentioned that AEP's zonal transmission rate has significantly increased, about 15 percent per year over the past six years. I'm wondering if you can explain that to the folks back home and then answer the question that that's obviously a significant increase for customers in my area. Are there sufficient consumer protections in place to prevent unnecessary investments in the future? So first explain why it's going up so much, and then if you can do it quickly, and then what do we need to do to protect folks? Well, I, I would answer it, Congressman, by saying, uh, as I did to Congressman Long, I, it's, too, it's too rich an investment for the people who own and build new transmission. It's too rich. Uh, we need to reduce returns on equity. We need to make sure we're not providing incentives on transmission investment for a run-of-the-mill standard transmission line. Uh, that's, that's certainly number one. Uh, number two, uh, as I've said, I think we need uh, more people at the table from the very beginning. Um, owners of transmission need to let those of us who need the transmission to get their generation to load to be at that table and to, and to own a load ratio share. These are the people these are the people who represent customers, real customers. And if they are at the table, I think they're going to do a lot of good work to make sure that, that there's no gold plating, there's not any overbuilding, that we build exactly what it is we need to get generation to load. It's a long process. It requires your influence on the FERC. Uh, it, it requires uh, lots of people talking about these issues. It's easy to say. We want somebody at the table. If you're a transmission owner, you want to be a transmission owner and do exactly what you want. If there's other voices at that table, it gets a little bit messier. 
I think you get a better product if that's what happens. Well, I appreciate that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back so somebody else can get a question in. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Long, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Anybody want a question? Do you take the time? Mr. Johnson, Mr. you recognize. Mr. Mr. Castor. I'm sorry, he wants to take time from. Oh, gotcha, yeah. yeah. Good Yielding idea. back. Your rights yield to Mr. Johnson. Mr. Griffith, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll make these quick. M Mr. Clark, you know, one of the primary objectives of Order 1000 was to promote inner regional transmission development, but there is broad consensus that Order 1000 failed to achieve that goal. So in your opinion, how could this objective be achieved? Sure. It I think part of it is, uh, Congressman, and thank you for the question, part of it is, as I said, attempting to focus in on what you're actually trying to accomplish in the rule. The rule itself is expansive. It ran <clears throat> several hundred pages long. The compliance filings are probably thousands of pages on top of that. And I think part of the reason that it you get that result is the order tried to do a lot of things all at once. It was partly competition policy. It was partly an investment policy. It was partly a regional planning policy. It was partly a cost allocation policy. Some of it dealt with intra-regional things, some of it inter-regional things. And when you, when you push that much out in a rule and expect the regions to do something with it, you end up with, in my opinion, just a lot of bureaucracy and checking compliance boxes. That's why I say I think putting the order on a diet and trying to focus in on what you're really looking at doing is probably would be the most helpful thing. Um, some of it may be reinforcing some of the, the planning conversations that happen, but without the more prescriptive elements of it. And I think part of it might be focusing um, more on the issue of interregional projects as opposed to spending a lot of time within these regions having to vet through and try to manage type of intra-regional projects that were happening organically prior to the order itself. Okay. Uh, what would be the advantages of greater inter-regional transmission? Because you have an interconnected grid, um, both in the west and then in the, the eastern interconnect, there may be certain projects that serve a broad regional benefit that have um, uh, benefit that accrues to many times over. But if you're only looking within your region, you might not see the value of the benefit of those particular lines. Um, some of them could be reliability lines, some could be um, market efficiency lines, but some sort of process to have a yardstick to compare the inter-regional type of projects um, might be valuable, and that may not have been captured in earlier FERC orders such as, as 890. All right, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Castor, five minutes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all the witnesses who are here today. We recently, in the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, had an oversight hearing on uh, the state of the grid in Puerto Rico. I want to thank the committee for continuing to, to focus on our neighbors in Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, right after the Army Corps of Engineers and DOE uh, testified that they thought they had things on track, they had a major outage again. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask you all to, after to supplement the record with any recommendations moving forward there. Clearly there's a, a, uh, an issue on transmission and, and the need for microgrids and more resiliency there. Uh, but as we work to mo modernize the grid everywhere and uh, deal with the, the cost of the changing climate and build in greater resiliency, we need to make sure we're taking advantage of non-transmission alternat non alternatives such as microgrid, uh, distributed energy resources and energy storage. Non-transmission alternatives not only have significant environmental benefits, but they can help prevent long-term area-wide blackouts after natural disasters like we saw in Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico this summer. We also need to be focusing on the needs of consumers and be a lot smarter. Uh, these non-transmission alternatives can be a great benefit to consumers. FERC orders 890 and 1000 recognize the benefits of non-transmission alternatives requiring regional transmission plans to consider whether non-transmission alternatives can more efficiently and cost-effectively meet the needs of a region. But despite all these benefits, these alternatives are not being utilized to the extent they should be, especially given how these uh, advanced technologies such as energy, how, how uh, advanced the technologies have become. So Mr. Gramlich and, and Mr. Twitty, do you think 
that if there was a stronger FERC order that required more than just consideration of alternatives, we would see uh, greater use? And what are the barriers to broader deployment and utilization? I do. Thank you for the question. Uh, for reliability and resilience, uh, you, you, can improve, um, you can improve both by better monitoring and control of the infrastructure. It seems obvious. We do it for with just about every other form of infrastructure uh, with um, better monitoring and control systems and uh, computing power in, uh, all through our economy. Uh, we have these opportunities to monitor and control better, and that helps with reliability as well as efficiency. So transmission's no different. The only problem is it's a regulated industry. The incentives, as I said, are misaligned, and the planning requirements are not up to date with the new opportunities we have. Mr. Twitty, short answer. Congresswoman, thank you for the opportunity to respond to that. I, I would certainly agree with uh, uh, those comments. Uh, and I would suggest to somebody who used to have responsibility for keeping lights on, uh, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that all of us are after. And um, um, technology is a wonderful thing. It marches along, and yet implementing it in the real world, getting the right kind of investment at the right time uh, is always going to be critical. Uh, and uh, making sure it works as it relates to the total grid. It's one of the challenges today of intermittent resources. Wind and solar are, are wonderful, and we're all trying to figure out ways to harness them properly, but when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, it's a real challenge. So you have to have a system designed that can take this intermittent resource, and in the case of microgrids, uh, sort of turn over control of a part of your grid to others, and for people again, like Dr. Izzo, who have responsibility for keeping lights on today, that's a pretty nervous thing because uh, if it doesn't work properly, if the technology isn't fully baked, uh, lights go out. Highlights the importance of planning and investment. Thank exactly. you so much. Thank you. And seeing there are no further members wishing to ask questions, I'd like to thank all our witnesses again for being here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Much obliged. Before we conclude, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit the following documents for the record, a letter from Gridlance and a letter from Wires. Without objection, so ordered. In pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And I ask that the witnesses respond within 10, 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. Without objection, this subcommittee is adjourned. Done. <laughs> hey, come back.